Over a year has passed since COVID-19 forced the world to shut its doors. Millions of lives have been lost and millions more have undergone radical change. At times, many of us have wished to see loved ones, friends and colleagues. We've longed to play sports, attend shows and travel the world. We've hoped that everything can return to normal, but should it? What if this pandemic has highlighted issues in our societies that have been ignored or marginalized for too long? What if normal made the pandemic worse than it needed to be? And what if normal is part of the problem? According to philosopher Vittorio Bufaki, this is precisely the case. Everything must change. Vittorio Bufaki is a senior lecturer in philosophy at University College Cork, specializing in questions concerning social injustice, human rights, and political violence. As we shall see, Bufaki's work demonstrates that philosophy can and should engage with the most pressing social issues of our time. Philosophy, says Bufaki, can navigate us towards better ideas and a better world. And it is during times of crisis that we need it most. Hello and welcome to episode 97 of the Pan Psycast. I'm the nasty, brutish and short Jack Symes and I'm joined once again by the Kantian who never leaves his hometown of Königsberg, pandemic or not, it's Mr. Andrew Horton. Hello. And our roadmap out of inequality, it's Dr. Vittorio Bufaki. Thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to have you on, Vittorio. Just a quick warning to listeners before we get going, there's going to be some delicate topics discussed in this episode relating to death, assault, and the COVID-19 pandemic as well. If you prefer something a little more cheery, why not check out our episodes on slavery, Schopenhauer, and misogyny, but in all seriousness, sensitive topics ahead, so just be aware. Okay, Vittorio, we're going to be discussing your forthcoming book, Everything Must Change, which me and Andrew had the pleasure of reading before it's coming out in June of this year. Links in the iTunes description to pre-order. And if you're listening after June, then it's available now. You discuss this question quite a few times within the book itself, and it's the first question we ask all of our guests. What is philosophy? So we're starting at the deep end. (laughs) Philosophy, as far as I'm concerned, is a tool to make sense of everything that goes on around us. And I think that's the beauty of philosophy. Some people like to think that philosophy will give you the truth. Mm. I'm quite skeptical of that. But philosophy is certainly a useful tool in the journey towards something that might be the truth. I found it very useful, especially during the pandemic. Mm. I, I had no intention of writing a book like the one that I wrote. And what happened in the first lockdown... We were all experiencing globally Mm. something that no one expected. We weren't ready for it. And of course, we had to make sense of it. And I found that philosophy was actually a very useful tool. I know some philosophers will not admit to this, but I think that whenever you write a book, you are writing it for yourself before you write it for the readers. And so... I wanted to make sense of what was going on. Mm. And there are ethical and political issues, which is what I deal with in philosophy. And I just asked myself, well, with my knowledge of philosophy, can I make sense of this? Mm -hmm. And then you start just writing some notes and then they just build up into a book. (laughs) It's an interesting one because this pandemic has been dominated by all sorts of experts. And I think philosophers are experts, and I think they do have a valuable voice that needs to be heard. As we do the show, we agree that philosophers should be heard, in particularly with certain expertise they might have of making sense of things. Just to quote you towards the end of the book, you say, I like to think of philosophy as the art and science of puzzle solving, where the solving the puzzle is not the end itself, but the first step to action and engagement with the social world. Do you think that active engagement in the social world is really the core purpose of what philosophy should be about? Or is there areas of philosophy that are just purely puzzle solving, like how many angels can dance on the end of a pin, for instance? Is there any point in doing that kind of mental gymnastics, as it were? Yeah, whether the angels are dancing on... Is that a puzzle? (laughs) I'm not sure. (laughs) But you're right. I don't think there's always a straightforward answer Mm. in the sense that I think there is room for 
puzzle solving in philosophy, mm -hmm. which is more technical. And there's also room for philosophy that is more action guiding. Right. And they're not mutually exclusive. And I think this is actually part of the big debate that has been on the scene for the last few years about public philosophy. Mm -hmm. There wasn't a great deal of public philosophy 20 years ago. There's a lot more of it now. And philosophers are debating whether public philosophy is philosophy at all or, <laughs> or whether some people argue that that's the true philosophy. I actually think that that's not worth debating because mm -hmm. you can have it both ways. But going back to what you were saying, I mentioned this a very end of the book, there is a certain view about philosophy, and this is often quoted. I mean, a lot of people don't read Hegel, and for good reasons, perhaps. <laughs> it's not, not the easiest of philosophers to read, but everyone knows this quote, that philosophy is the owl of Minerva that mm. takes flight only at dusk, which means that philosophy only happens after the event, and philosophy is there to clear things up. So when you're writing the book, you're writing it during the pandemic itself, I think from between March of last year and, and November of last year, around about. Is there a worry that when we're writing about them during the crisis, we're going to rely somewhat on speculation? As in, it's just obvious that once the event has taken place, we will know more, as Hegel says, about the crisis than we will during the crisis. Yes, we will know more, but there is work to be done during the crisis mm. because during the crisis, there are decisions to be made. And those mm -hmm. decisions have to be made on the basis of principles. And principles are based on ideas and ideas are based on philosophy. So I don't accept that we just have to sit back and wait for the shit to hit the fan and then philosophers come and do the cleaning up. I think philosophers actually have to get involved in the issues. Mm. And of course, other philosophers will come at, at the end and do other work. But especially with this pandemic, because the issues and decisions that we were making were decisions of life and death. Mm -hmm. That's philosophy. And so we need some theoretical framework. We're not just tossing a coin and making a decision. And so perhaps I favor that kind of philosophy, the one that actually gets its hands dirty and actually deals with the issue as they occur. I've been criticized by philosophers for not being a pure philosopher mm -hmm. because I rely on empirical data for some of the things I write. Well, my reply is, I'm sorry, this is what philosophy should do. I mean, empirical data gives us a snapshot of the real world and philosophers are supposed to interpret the real world. So I work with empirical uh, facts. And I think, as it turns out, is a perfect segue in, into our next question. Many of the philosophers we interview have said that they have intellectual heroes. And the first one on our list is Patricia Churchland, who would echo your sentiment there perfectly about needing empirical data to really talk meaningfully about philosophy. Otherwise, as she says, you're just another person with an opinion, um, which I'm sure some philosophers might feel strongly about. But she says her intellectual heroes were Paul Churchland, Francis Crick, and Willard Quine, Rutger Bregman. Google searched and revealed Bertrand Russell to be his hero. Olivia Coombs said David Lewis and Gregory Miller. Has there been anyone for you that's particularly influenced your philosophical thinking, Vittorio? Too many to list. When we had the first lockdown mm. in March of last year, I was 80% into writing a book on the Roman philosopher Cicero. Mm -hmm. And I only had a little bit to go. Uh, and the book isn't finished yet because this one took over. But I was working on Cicero and Roman political thought. In fact, there was quite a bit of Cicero in this book because that was in the back of my mind. There's this quote by Cicero that really explains why I wrote the book. He says, if you have a garden and a library, you have everything you need. <laughs> and in the first lockdown, and I'm ashamed to say that I absolutely loved the first lockdown because there was no pressure to go anywhere. Mm. We run around like headless chickens, taking kids right, left and center and running into lecturing. And I was at home, I have a garden, I have a library, I have time. <laughs> Fantastic. And I loved it. So, you know, Cicero was there and I was thinking, okay, this isn't right. I know that I'm very lucky, mm. but so many people are not. And pe so many people are suffering. And that suffering made me think about the injustice of what was going to happen and was starting to happen. And that injustice takes me to Marx. Now, can you have Cicero and Marx in the same <laughs> sentence? I think you can, because depending on the question 
depending on the problem or the puzzle mm. that you're solving, different philosophers can give you different intuitions. So a final introductory question from us and another classic one we like to ask all of our guests. A lot of them have changed significantly on a big philosophical position throughout their lives. So many say they converted from atheism to theism, from theism to atheism, materialism to non-materialism and, and vice versa. Have there been any big shifts like this in your own thinking? Yes, I mean, I'm shifting all the time. And I think after a while, you just get used to it. It's that feeling that you have after um, a pint too many. And, you know, yeah, you know, things are not <laughs> stable, but you know that nothing's going to happen. And I th actually think it's a, it's a sign of a good philosopher because you have to question yourself all the time. Mm -hmm. And you cannot afford to be dogmatic. I guess I started in a more serious way 30 years ago when I was doing my PhD and I did it on John Rawls and social justice, which is what everyone else was doing in political philosophy. And if you are a Rawlsian, you are almost automatically a Kantian. That I have perhaps more doubts about at the moment. I find Hume actually more intriguing than Kant. But again, I mean, I think Marx has always been there. I have mm. no problem with Cicero. And the other one that I adore is Hobbes. And Hobbes actually has a whole chapter in the book. Hobbes always gets me in trouble because Hobbes <laughs> has a bad reputation. You know, if people think of Hobbes as a proto-fascist. And if you're nice to Hobbes, then... And that's just because I think it's just a misunderstanding of, of Hobbes. So... I'm part Hobbesian, part Marxist, part Rawlsian. <laughs> well, that explains a lot of the things in the book because you roll all of these thinkers in there and you're thinking, well, which one does he agree with? Because they're all they're like this, this huge blend of characters you wouldn't expect from history all on the page together along with your own thought. You can't tell from reading it. Part one, the pandemic. Now, in the book, as we've just said, you wrote between March and November of 2020, you say, and I quote, estimates of the worst case scenario vary, but more than 2 million people worldwide will die from COVID-19 unless a vaccine is developed. Now, recording today in April 2021, the number of worldwide deaths, as we know, is officially higher than 3 million people, even worse than you first thought was the worst case scenario a year ago. So now the majority of these deaths have been amongst those above the age of 65. And your book aims to show that the pandemic highlights injustices and prejudices, which are deeply rooted within our societies. So do you think the number of fatalities amongst the elderly tells us anything about how we value them as a society? It's always risky to predict the number and I got it wrong mm. and we're not finished yet so the number is going to go up mm -hmm. when I handed the manuscript vaccines were still not um, being used so it's a frightening number mm -hmm. and it's going to get worse I think I wrote the book because of this sense of injustice mm -hmm. contrary to what we were being told a year ago which is okay this pandemic is happening and it's a great misfortune. We're just being very unlucky that it's happening. And the virus is blind to gender and ethnicity. And, um, and you know, anyone is equally vulnerable. No, that's not true. Mm -hmm. It is true in one sense, and certainly not in the other sense, which is that we know, because actually we do have the numbers now, there are some groups that are disproportionately mm -hmm. vulnerable and have suffered more than others. Ethnic minorities, working class people, women. If you are disabled, you're twice as likely to die from COVID than if you're not. These are significant things. And so, yes, the elderly is another group mm -hmm. that, it was the first group that perhaps got our attention. And so what do you think it is about perceptions maybe or prejudices against the elderly that have put them in that? How do we see the elderly as a society in, in the Western world? So the elderly, it's an interesting group. And the reason why the book starts with old age is because that is the title of a wonderful piece by Cicero. Mm. And again, Cicero comes in because I was just writing about it when this happened. And Cicero, more than 2,000 years ago, has this short piece where he says, everyone thinks that the worst thing that can happen to you is to get old and that, you know, you, we should pity the old. And he says, wrong. It is possibly 
the best time of your life. Mm -hmm. And he goes through a number of arguments suggesting why this prejudice that people have against old age is wrong. And I think it's fantastic because everything he says still applies today as it did 2000 years ago. Could you give an example for listeners? Why doesn't he think that being old is a bad thing, Cicero? So one thing he says is that some people think that it's bad because you're physically frail. Right. And so he says there's an assumption here that if you're physically strong, then you're better than if you are physically weak. And he says, well, what nonsense, because some of the best contribution you can make does not require physical force. It requires intellect. And actually, people are a certain age have wisdom that the young don't have. And with that wisdom, actually, and this is the important bit, people can still make a contribution. Mm. When I ask my students, okay, old age, you know, when does it start? You know, we have to draw the line somewhere. You know, how do we know someone is old? The standard (laughs) answer is, oh, when you retire. So there's this assumption that if you're productive economically, you're Mm. useful. And once you retire, you are and has been. And yes, we'll take care of you, but you have nothing more to contribute. I mean, how many philosophers have written outstanding pieces of work in their 70s? I mean, I like to think that my best piece of work is still to come. I was thinking when I I read this in the book, so Cicero says that there are three stages of life. And in that third stage, as you say, it's not that bad. Your body might let you down. But the best bit of being a human isn't the body. It's having a mind and it's learned all this stuff and it's ready to tackle these philosophical questions and our best works ahead of us. But now we have this fourth age or stage of life, thanks to developments in health and medicine. So it seems that his or even your defense of old age says that our best intellectual days are ahead of us. But is this still true as we now have a fourth stage of life? So it might have been for Cicero. So when I'm thinking in between 40 and 60, I can do loads of great work. To take this example of one statistic, nearly one million people in the UK suffer from dementia which is one in 10 people over the age of 65. And an estimated 80% of people living in care homes have either dementia or severe memory problems. And as we know, the care homes were hit really hard, as you point out in your book at the start of the pandemic. And that's just one problem, memory. So does Cicero's arguments still apply to people in old age in the same way today as they did when Cicero was writing? It's an interesting one. There is an argument that at least the wealthy families, you could live in your 90s, even in ancient Rome. Mm. So maybe things are not as different as we like to think. But I take your point. Yes, we have more people who live past 80 today than we did um, Mm. 2000 years ago. And yes, dementia is an issue, a bigger issue today than it was then. Now, there's still a big contribution you can make between 65 and 80. And there are people beyond 80 who are still active. So it doesn't affect everyone. There is a responsibility that we have to those people. Mm -hmm. But the language that was used by some politicians towards the elderly was spectacularly disrespectful. Mm. There was a sense in which you could sacrifice the old for the sake of keeping the economy going. I'm glad you mentioned that point because you highlight the dangers of herd immunity that was a policy discussed openly by Boris Johnson in in the UK. So they they weren't committed to the idea, but it was at least something that was out there in the press. And so there is this sense that the government were hinting at economics over human life, especially the elderly, as they were the likely people who were going to be most affected by this. But since you suggest that disrespect of the elderly is a byproduct of the type of society we live in, in that when people say you're past your sell-by date, after retirement, you're not productive, you're not worthwhile anymore. That isn't Mm. coming directly from the government. That must be something that is part of the shared consciousness of at least some people in society. So I guess I want your take on, do you think that there would be plenty of people in the UK or elsewhere who would have actually backed the herd immunity policy simply because they weren't thinking about the repercussions of how that might impact on the elderly? That's a very good question. I don't know because it's very hard to know. Mm. Possibly. And this is where I think the pandemic, just like any crisis, it often brings out the worst in people. Mm -hmm. And there was a sense in which things were going from bad to worse and people were understandably concerned about their well-being. And if there was a group that could be sacrificed so that we could go back to normal and back to generating profits and so on and so forth, that group could be the elderly. There were cases in the UK of 
patients with COVID being sent back to their institutions and care workers not having the PPE and the necessary protective equipment. Now, it's kind of interesting because you could almost understand that in Milan because that was the first European country that really experienced it badly. Mm -hmm. We had a couple of months before we came to North Europe and we didn't really prepare. It was predictable that the old were going to be suffering. I think this is a great part to bring in the distinction you make between injustices and misfortunes because, Mm. of course, if it was simply just a misfortune that these things happened and there was no control over it, then that might be one thing. But as you just said there, there was time and, and, and you highlight throughout the book that we could have had better sources of PPE long before this was ever a problem. So you, you write that the devastating impact of a hurricane or the trauma of a brain tumor are dreadful, awful realities, but they can be deemed mere misfortunes. And injustice, on the other hand, is caused by a fellow humans, not nature. And this made me think of two things. Firstly, is this the same distinction to be drawn within philosophy of religion with natural and moral evils? And secondly, which of these categories does the pandemic fall into on the whole? Of course, it can be seen in, in somewhat in both ways. I'm not really in a position to, to comment on philosophy of religion. I'm afraid I'm uh, <laughs> behind with my reading on that. The distinction between a misfortune and an injustice, mm. in a sense, that's the backbone of the book. And again, I think it's interesting because we tell a story about the pandemic. And Mm -hmm. I wrote the book because I was getting frustrated with the kind of story that people were telling, telling themselves and telling others. It's just a blip in history. We're just very unfortunate that it happened in our lifetime. Mm -hmm. It will probably not happen again. It's this idea that it's almost like they were being struck by lightning, but they Mm -hmm. weren't struck by lightning. You know, this is a lacuna in public health. It's a lacuna in the politics and and economics of our society. So when a school collapses because of an earthquake, that's not just a misfortune. Because if it collapses in a place like Haiti that has earthquakes and it collapses because Mm -hmm. the builders were cutting corners and they were using inferior material, and people were were lining their pockets. No, that's an injustice. Now, what's the difference here? So the difference is that a true misfortune cannot be predicted, cannot be controlled. It's an act of nature. Sometimes it happens. This, well, there was a lot more that we could have done. We know that it could have been different because 26 people died in New Zealand Mm. and hundreds of thousands died in other parts of the world. So what's the difference there? Well, the difference there is actually politics and political leadership, amongst other things. Well, in the book, you say in some way or another that the actual emergence of COVID-19 itself is a misfortune. But then what comes from that and the way we deal with it is an injustice. But this made me think of what I feel of from my analysis and from my reading around the pandemic leading up to your book was that no one seems to be talking about the fact that the emergence of COVID-19 is itself an injustice. So some of the world's leading scientists have found that the variations of the virus are around in bats and pangolins across Southeast Asia. And as one of our previous guests, Peter Singer, has written on the pandemic, and I'll give you this quote here, it's a, it's a very powerful one. Few mention, let alone confront, the underlying cause of the pandemic. Both the 2003 SARS epidemic and the current one can be traced to China's, quote, wet markets. Open air markets where animals are bought live and then slaughtered on the spot for the customers. For the animals, wet markets are hell on earth. Thousands of sentient, palpitating beings endure hours of suffering and anguish before being brutally butchered. This is just one small part of the suffering that humans systematically inflict on animals in every country, in factory farms, laboratories, and in the entertainment industry. So if Singer was here today, or if he read your book, I was thinking he might say, Vittorio, that you're amongst these philosophers who are ignoring the greatest injustice of all of this, which is that the fact that the COVID-19 pandemic emerged in the first place, and the fact that these pandemics keep occurring, or these variants of the virus keep jumping from non-human animals to humans, is because of the way we're treating animals. And maybe this bleeds into your solution as well. At the end of the book quote, you say, the best vaccine against COVID-19 and future pandemics is less inequality and more social justice. And I understand why you say that off the back of the political philosophy you promote in the book. 
But then I think, no, right? The best vaccine against COVID-19 is to stop slaughtering animals. It actually takes us back to what we were saying before, because on the question of how it started, that's the Isle of Minerva. We kind of have to wait until we really know how it started. So my manuscript was finished in November. I think it was only January that the WHO actually went to China to inspect. And the conclusion is actually an open verdict whether it really started from that one wet market as mm-hmm. everyone assumed now maybe it did maybe it didn't but it's inconclusive so on that issue i think it's more of okay when we know more then we can draw conclusions but i would agree with singer that there are certainly things that made it more likely for this to happen. Mm. So things like deforestation and the impact that that has on animals, absolutely. So I just wanted to, in making that statement that, okay, maybe it was a misfortune that it started, but let's just see the injustice of what occurred Mm -hmm. afterwards. I was just giving the benefit of the doubt. I mean, we know that those viruses will happen. You know, pandemics do happen. You know, they're usually mm-hmm. contained before they become as comprehensive as this one. Some experts say that they were expecting this to happen. It was just mm-hmm. a question of time. The book focuses on eight lessons to learn from lockdown, the pandemic. And just to push you on this same question then, because it's most of them are how we see the elderly, how we organize our societies to remove injustices. But there isn't a chapter on uh, global warming, the climate emergency, or on how we treat non-human animals. So I'm just wondering if if you were to write a larger book, right? Because obviously it's a smaller piece and you want the chapters to flow and follow a common theme. But is one of the lessons from lockdown, do you think that we do need to follow Singer's argument to its conclusion and eradicate this mass slaughter of animals? Absolutely. But I think one can make that argument even without the pandemic. Right. So it's a valid point, but it's not necessarily specific to the pandemic. Now, you can make the argument that you know, it made it more likely for the pandemic to happen. Fair enough. But I think it's valid per se. And if I were to write about animal rights and environmental issues, then it would be an encyclopedia and not a book. So there is only so much you can discuss in one book. Mm-hmm. Having said that, I've got 10 pages of notes since last November with an eye for a second edition. And that's something that I would definitely include. We are at the point where we can ask ourselves, why did this happen? And why did it happen Mm. now? And yes, the environmental issues and treatment of animals is part of that. Let us pause for a moment to say a quick thank you to all of our duty-bound patrons over at patreon.com forward slash pansycast for making this show possible. In particular, a very special thank you to the man staying calm throughout the pandemic. It's Mr. Adam Cool. When the government locked his doors, he said, no worries, I'll fire up the jug. It's Mr. T. He hasn't got the solution to alleviate social inequality. He's a very naughty boy. It's the life of Brian. Ramirez. Stuck in a cycle of never-ending lockdowns, it's Miss Lily Hooper. Calling on us to love God and report our neighbours, it's St. David Lejeunesse. Stockpiling ventilators, it's, <laughs> it's Jamie Lung. The man halting the vaccine rollout, it's Jay Wheelless. And last but not least, the man whose name is longer than all of the great pandemics combined, <laughs> it's Maron Vanderkolk. If you're enjoying the show, then please head over to patreon.com forward slash pansidecast to show your support. A link is also in the iTunes description. Right, let's jump back into it. I want to take the direction now into not the start of lockdown, but how people have responded to it and particularly how citizens have reacted towards measures that have been taken by government. So some of the biggest ones are lockdowns and asking citizens to wear masks. And this has highlighted a strong tension between citizens' belief in certain inalienable rights as they might see them and freedoms. And we've seen anti-lockdown protests and anti-masks and and even anti-vaccine protests across the world. Given the damage of these protests, which involve the view of citizens consisting in these rights and freedoms, do we want to reconsider as a society what it means to be a citizen? Yes, that's the short answer. (laughs) That's why I think it's important for philosophers to get into the arena with the pandemic. Mm. There are lessons to be learned here. And there are lessons that could actually make big changes for the future. So the way that we define citizenship is, in a sense, very narrow because we define citizenship in terms of 
overwhelmingly, not exclusively, but overwhelmingly a citizen in terms of their individual rights. And mm -hmm. those rights are often understood in terms of freedoms. This is often the way that morally the conversation starts. I'm an individual, I have rights, I have freedoms, and there's nothing that you can do to stop me. Who would have thought that Nozick's book in 1974 would be as prevalent as it is? You know, I mean, most philosophers that I know would side with Rawls, but Nozick is the one that really speaks the language that, that people understand. And so this idea that we have those rights and that is the starting point of our morality, I think with this pandemic, mm. the result is that people say, what about my right to not wear a mask? What about my right to take risks with my health? Mm. What about my right to travel? And so my argument here is that there's a different way to think about morality. It's not just about your rights. Of course, it's also that. But we have moral duties. Mm. And sometimes we should think of duties separately from our rights. So in philosophy of law, when we talk about a claim right, a claim right is a right that you have to the extent that there's a correlated duty that other people have. And so duties are secondary to, to rights. There is a different way to think about these issues, which is actually, as citizens, we have duties. And sometimes those duties trump our individual rights. And during mm. a crisis like this, I would say, yes, we have to think about the common good. This idea of the common good, which is old fashioned, is not only old fashioned, it's gone out of fashion because everything is about individuals and my self-interest. Right. So we're in a phase in our society's history where we're focused on the individual rights rather than the collective good. And in the case of a pandemic in particular, we need to have a heavy shift towards the latter because you don't have a right to go out and not wear a mask or go and meet your friends at some underground pub or something like that. Now, Tala Berkey has estimated that there's around 58 million anti-vaxxers worldwide. So this raises a question, I thought, in regards to your view of duties as to whether or not we have a moral obligation to have the vaccine. So as we've just said, you don't have the right to go to the pub, you've got a duty to protect your fellow citizen. But does that extend to having a needle put into your arm? So do you think people have a moral responsibility to take the vaccination? And if they refuse, do we have a moral responsibility to hunt them down, chase them down the street, pin them down and, and stick it in their arm? I would argue that there is such a thing as a moral duty. Mm. It's a slightly different issue whether that gives you a legal right to, as you say, stick a needle in someone's arm. So there's slightly separate issues. On the moral duty part, mm. where does that duty come from? This is where going back centuries, I think it's, it's helpful because this idea that we have one overarching moral duty, which is mm -hmm. not to harm others. And this has been around for thousands of years. And it's interesting because something like this premium non nocere idea, uh, first do no harm, you find the references to it in consequentialist philosophers, Kantian philosophers, virtue, you know, every school of thought in ethics would have a form of first do no harm. Now, in terms of this pandemic, why is that particularly important? Because hundreds of people died looking after people who had the virus. Mm. You have hundreds of nurses, hundreds of doctors, hundreds or thousands of care workers who died looking after patients. Me getting sick is not just my right because I can do what I want in my life. Mm -hmm. And I do believe in that element of self-ownership. If I want to destroy my life, maybe I have a right to do it, fine. But your risk of getting this virus puts other people's life at risk. And then you have a duty towards them. You have a duty to the nurse that is going to be there putting a tube down your throat. Mm. So that duty, I think, trumps your, I don't want to wear a mask because it's inconvenient. Mm -hmm. I want to go on holiday around the world during a pandemic. I haven't left Ireland in 14 months. I missed my father's funeral a month ago because we're not traveling. And then I hear that people are going to Spain on vacation. So I don't want to hear... I have a right of mobility. Well, yes, of course we do, but we have duties as well. Now, going from the fact that we have a duty not 
to put other people's life at risk and therefore we have a duty not to get sick. Does that mean that we can force people to have a vaccine? Can we force people to put a needle in their arms so on and so forth? I have notes for the second edition, but I have a more other argument. But what I would say mm -hmm. is that it would be legitimate for someone to lose their job if they are not prepared to take the vaccine. Oh, wow. If you work in a school and you don't take the vaccine, now that's your choice, perhaps, but then you cannot, again, put other people at risk. Mm. So there must be some costs to, no, I'm not going to take the vaccine. We've just been addressing the responsibilities and rights of citizens, but you make it clear that political leaders have had a lot of impact on how countries have responded to the pandemic. In particular, you tackle the topics of populism, post-truth politics, and public trust in experts. What role do you think these things have had during the pandemic? I think they had a very big role. And in one sense, I'm glad they had a big role because there is no doubt that in this pandemic, politics made a difference. If 26 people died in New Zealand and hundreds of thousands died somewhere else, notwithstanding the difference in populations, that is about politics. And mm -hmm. the reason why I say that, in a sense, I'm glad is because just before the pandemic, what kind of political debates were we having prior to the pandemic, which seems like a lifetime ago, but it's yeah. only a year ago. You know, that was a time when populism was going from strength to strength, mm -hmm. where people were not taking politics seriously. Why not have a clown as a prime minister? Because it's entertaining. And anyway, all politicians are the same and it doesn't make a difference. No, it does make a difference. If you have a Bolsonaro as your president, as opposed to Lula, that would make a difference. Mm -hmm. Having Trump as a president probably killed thousands of people. Mm -hmm. Politicians actually play a very important role and we have to take politics seriously. Good leadership, as we've seen in New Zealand, has been rewarded, deserves to be rewarded. And so in, in a very extreme way, mm -hmm. a lot of us had to learn serious lessons about going around saying that there is no such thing as truth and that experts are just fools. No. And that's, you know, and politics is a form of expertise. You seem to suggest in the book, and correct me if I'm wrong, that all of these things, post-truth, distrust in experts, populism, etc., are all tied in with right-wing politics. But as we found in our conspiracy theories episodes we did a few weeks back, left-wing voters are just as susceptible to conspiracies, misinformation, alternative facts, and charismatic leaders. So do we risk oversimplifying the issue when we say right-wing bad, left-wing good? I think it's fairly accurate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, anyone and everyone obviously is susceptible to conspiracies. Mm. But I do think that it's more prevalent amongst right-wing thinkers. I may be wrong, and this is, in a sense, this is an empirical question, mm. but in the circles that I inhabit, I haven't found that. And so, again, there is a risk of saying, oh, well, there's no difference between the right and the left. And I'm certainly not suggesting that everyone in the right is a certain mm. type. Absolutely not. But in terms of the tendency to populism, I think it's much stronger with a, a right-wing ideology. And partly because there is an element of authoritarianism <laughs> that I think it's a seed within uh, populism. I suppose, like you say, that's an empirical question that unless we start digging out lots of statistics, it's not going to make for fruitful listening. But one thing which will make for fruitful listening is mystery philosopher. The mystery philosopher. So you're going to hear the voice of a mystery philosopher from the past. You've got to try and guess who it is. Here it is. Hostile to the past, impatient of the present, and cheated of the future. We were much like those whom men's justice or hatred forces to live behind prison bars. Any idea who that might be? Uh, no, I need clues. <laughs> I assume that was not their voice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I can't comment as to whether or not it was their voice <laughs> or some period. brilliant impersonator in the background. It's uncanny anyway. Andrew, uh, Vittorio's passing. He wants a clue, but do you need a clue for that one? Um, uh, I don't know. I'll just take a wild guess and go Foucault. No. Here, so I'm going to jump back to Vittorio for this and here are your clues. He's an author, a goalkeeper and a philosopher. Okay. That could be Camus. 
Yeah, it's yeah, okay, exactly. very good. Well as soon done. As you said the goalkeeper thing. I was like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> he was better at some things. <laughs> Not so good. So much. I reread the plague while I was writing the book, and I open every chapter with a quote from Camus. I don't usually reread books because life is too short, and there are so many books that I haven't read. Mm. But I wanted to reread it because I wanted to see how much I had missed out. Because obviously, if you read it, never having experienced a plague uh, as opposed to reading it during a plague. It is phenomenal. It, it really is. I haven't read it a few years back and having read your book, it made me really want to pick it up again. Some of the quotes you picked out were absolutely beautiful. So thank you for doing so. But something that's even better than Albert Camus' The Plague is supporting us on Patreon. Go to patreon.com forward slash pansycast to support the show. Next week's installment where we continue our conversation with Vittorio is already out there now, as well as some of our beautiful mugs. So head over there to get your hands on one of them. All right, we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining us for another episode of the Pan Sai Cast. The next instalment of this episode will be available on the following Monday. Patreon subscribers already have access to the latest episode of the Pan Sai Cast. To support the show and get early access to all of the episodes, you can visit us on Patreon. That's www.patreon.com forward slash Pan The link is also in the iTunes description. For all the reading and to find out more about the show and get all of the old episodes completely free, you can visit www.thepansycast.com. From all of us here at The Pansycast, thank you for your support and thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much. It's been lots of fun. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for listening. Thank you for listening. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening. Thank you all. I've enjoyed it a lot. Thanks a lot. You're very welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye. I really appreciate what you folks are trying to do. That was great. That was really good. You guys really read up on this. That was good. Wow. (laughs) That was a lot of fun. You guys uh, managed to combine the banter and the philosophy perfectly, I think. Beautiful. Fantastic. Oh, well done, you guys. Gosh, you're doing a wonderful thing with this. (laughs)